So real quick before we get started, uh, how many people in here use Stripe? A lot. So that's your context for this conversation. Awesome. <laughs> Um, so it's great to have you here. Um, I think we're, we're going to dive into a couple of different questions that Rob and I have talked about and uh, wanted to ask John from the stage. And then after that, we're going to take some listener questions or, you know, it's questions from the audience. I say listener questions because the podcast. But uh, we'll take some questions from you guys and um, we will go from there. Um, obviously, there may be a few things that he can't answer just because of legal reasons or anything like that, but he'll try his best to answer whatever he can. Um, so the first question I have for you is, what was the biggest initial challenge you ran into when you were building Stripe and developing it? Mm. Um, well, the, the, kind of the, the, the first issue we ran into was that we really had no idea how to build Stripe. Uh, and what I mean by that is, uh, I think it was, I, I sometimes talk about Stripe as a, as a fairly obvious idea in that any of us who, you know, I was among them, any of us who had actually had to use one of the existing merchant account providers were kind of tearing your hair out, uh, and this was, it was fairly obvious, the, the need for it. And so Patrick and I, we were actually in, uh, in college at the time, and uh, we, we decided to build something better. You know, we said, how hard can it be? Um, actually, pretty hard, it turns out. Um, but uh, with that uh, kind of... Um, aspect that only I think uh, you can have when you're, when you're 19, where nothing seems difficult, um, uh, we set out to build it. So we, we stubbed out the API and what it should do. You know, it's like, okay, you accept a credit card here, and then like, the money arrives in your bank account. And then we're like, okay, what comes next? Um, and so we legit spent a long time kind of searching and casting about for the right partners in the financial industry and learning how to speak their language. That was one of the hardest things, trying to gain some measure of credibility um, you know, w one of the ways we got our, our, our very first partnerships uh, with um, uh, Wells Fargo uh, was uh, a, an investor, you know, an early investor put us in touch. And so we kind of had to have that credibility and that connection um, in that regard. So that was kind of issue number one was we spent a good two years pre-launch working on it because we were navigating the financial industry. Uh, and then the second issue was that the... I think everyone in this community gets that one of the best things you can do is to shorten feedback loops so that you can iterate on the product quicker. And so that's why it's so useful to actually sit down and talk to customers. And that's why it's so useful to, to come to things like this. You want a really tight feedback loop on your, on your product development uh, process. That was really hard by, for, for Stripe's product by its nature because People you know, would only use Stripe when they're actually ready to go and charge for what they were building, and even then it would take them a while to integrate and stuff like this. So we'd fairly quickly give people access to Stripe, and you know, six months later, they might get it up and running. So I actually went back, and in advance of this, I was curious to look at what the, the shape of the sign-up curve looked like. And uh, we, you know, the first commit was October 11th, 2009, and uh, it was only two years later that we got 100 businesses on Stripe, and so you know it was a really slow ramp initially, uh, and that was pretty hard because just from a product management point of view, it's it's hard to know what your customers want when you have no customers. So how long did it take you before you got your first customer? So you said you started in 2008 timeframe, you spent a couple of years, and then it took you two years to get to that hundredth customer. Yep. What was the time between the zero customer, you know, no customers and one customer? No customers to one customer was actually pretty quick, or what I think of as pretty quick, in that it was three months, but we were working on it part time, and so by January 2010, we had our our very first customer, um, it was uh, a guy called Ross Boucher, who was working on, at the time, I don't know if any of you guys have used the Cappuccino uh, web framework, which is implementing Cocoa in, uh, uh, in JavaScript, but uh, they were charging for the development kit. And, uh, and actually now, kind of full circle, uh, he's working on RunKit, which is part of Stripe. Um, and, uh, and he worked at Stripe for a while, so it's kind of very much within the family. But uh, so we got that first customer in three months. I think that was actually pretty helpful because Stripe is not you know, a one-shot product. You integrate Stripe and then you're on it. And so kind of three months in, when we were still working on it part-time, we kind of couldn't stop because you know, now we had paying on customers who were not just relying on us in some incidental way uh, uh, for, for a minor task. You know, their business was running on Stripe. And so we kind of had no option from there. Mm -hmm. So your first, uh, the first customer that you had paying you for Stripe, um, you eventually went on and acquired them, is that? So that's, I mean, that's a different customer acquisition, and I think that we're both, they're, we're <laughs> well, this is kind of much later in life too. in that, uh, you know, uh, Ross worked at Stripe for a while and then, uh, uh, then ended up uh, leaving and starting Runkit and then kind of came back and, yeah. So I guess in the, uh, the early days, like how much of your time was spent working on the, the technical stack versus going out and talking to people and trying to get the feedback and, and doing actual marketing for it? Because um, it seems to me that 
whenever I hear people talk about Stripe, it's almost never from an advertisement. They never heard of it from, you know, they never saw an ad, for example. They always heard about it from somebody else. So it seems like word of mouth is really that tri primary, primary channel. But, you know, like, what things did you do in the early days to try and help drive um, interest in uh, those conversations? Yeah, so one, I'll say, you know, um, uh, when talking about this stuff, uh, I, I'm not sure how generalizable any of Stripe's experience is because I'm, I'm pretty sure we were just like a weird special case. Uh, uh, and so, for, for example, to this day, if you go and actually Google Stripe payments right now, you'd expect to find like a branded keyword for Stripe, but we still haven't gotten around to doing that. Uh, and so you'll find an ad for Amazon payments if you do that. Um, but uh, what we, we did, obviously, a lot of very active customer development in the, in the early days. I think that... Uh, um, a, a few things we did that ended up proving really valuable. One is uh, messaging and actually telling the story clearly. I think people uh, talk about word of mouth as if it's some fundamental constant of the universe that you know, uh, you know, news about your product will sp spread at X rate. Uh, and obviously that's not true in that one, kind of the better you tell your, your story, two, kind of how much you tell your story and how much content marketing you do and things like this. Uh, and uh, third, how differentiated your story actually is. Those are all um, fa fairly fundamental inputs into the equation of, of, of word of mouth. And honestly, kind of to, um, to, to Ryan's point of um, you know, the, this feeling of SaaS being full uh, or you know, feeling like there are too many SaaS apps and you know, there, there aren't opportunities left, I think one of the challenges people sometimes run into is uh, you know, we, we've all used, uh, or, or at least a decent number of us have probably used HR systems. Uh, and you know, we use Workday at Stripe, uh, and you know, there's other options. And it feels like they're all horrendous to use, uh, or at least my experience with, with, with Workday uh, ha has been that from kind of a, a UX point of view. And uh, the, the obvious conclusion is like, oh, we should go so, you know, start a, uh, an HR app. Uh, there's, there's kind of other challenges with that market, but I think one of the challenges is just from a, from a differentiation point of view, standing out from the crowd is really, really challenging because there's like 100 HR apps out there. And so having something that will actually spread via word of mouth, you need to make it kind of um, ta tangible and, uh, and interesting. And so for us, the space we were competing in, it was basically all, it was PayPal who were kind of their own thing. Um, and, uh, and as far as I can tell, have a negative NPS. And uh, then, uh, no, 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 we, we went to look at these numbers recently. And then uh, uh, you had a bunch of banks and, and kind of people who are not used to speaking to the internet business community, to the developer community, everything like this. And so we made a, a huge effort early on to show that we were speaking the right language. We understood subscriptions. We understood SaaS. We understood internet business models. It was instant sign up. The reason we put code on the homepage was not, that's not the logical place in the you know, product cycle to put it, in that you want to have the homepage with a broad overview and then get the API docs. The reason we put code on the homepage that actually worked, and you know, to this day, you can copy that. Uh, a lot of people put code on the homepage, but no one actually does it where you can copy and paste like the actual code snippet, run it in a terminal, and it'll run a valid response. That was our way of showing that like we get it. You know, the API is important, and we're trying to communicate this um, to people. Same with the tagline, payments for developers. You know, I think there are lots of less crisp taglines you could have used. So that's my main thing on word of mouth, is I think people tend to, it's like, well, why aren't people talking about my thing? Whereas the, the, the messaging was probably the, the most, I, I can talk about other things, but I think that's the most valuable thing we did. Yeah, and I think it's interesting how you uh, specifically do that piece of it in that if you're logged in, um, it automatically injects the API tokens and stuff so that the, the developer hasn't, doesn't have to do an extra step on top of that. Was that, um, did, was that something that came up kind of in retrospect? You just did it to see how it would work, or was it like an intentional, deliberate choice early on? Like, hey, if we do this, people won't have to do these other things. It'll just work for them. Yeah, I think we, it, it became, uh, 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 we have since retrofitted a strategy on it, and so that way we can sound smart where it's like, what you do is, but That's it, what I was getting it, at. Exactly, yeah, yeah, <laughs> but it, it was very accidental at the time the way it, 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 it happened, and then we kind of learned from it, where in the beginning, I think you just do things that, uh, that feel right, and then you notice the things that are working particularly well, and you pour gas in them, and so in our case, what we found was that uh, things like, uh, you know, the fact that you, all the, um, API documentation was pre-filled with your API key, or we'd have just kind of some interesting and very detailed error messages and things like that. We did them just because it seemed like the helpful, useful thing to do at the time. What we found was that they actually drove word of mouth in that you can get API, you can get API error messages that are helpful enough that people will tweet, hey, look at how helpful this API error message is. That's not a thing we expected going in, and so now we actually do think about it in terms of when it comes to a launch or when it comes to functionality in the product, what is the, the thing that will be 
tweet worthy? What is the thing that is kind of surprising and good enough um, that, that people will actually go out and talk about it? Yeah, I mean, part of that um, kind of leads into the, the, uh, the just falling into things accidentally. And like, you, as I said, you, you look back at it retrospectively and say, oh, wow, this really worked. Um, and there's like a, a base level for some of those things where it's just they suck so bad that when you provide even a, a you know, a bare minimum experience for them that isn't that bad, um, that it, it reflects very, very positively on you. Um, now, when you were going through these processes, like, uh, do, you have, do you have a process in place for uh, putting those things together, whether it's the documentation now, or um, I guess, how early did you start that to be more intentional about those things versus looking back at them and saying, oh, this worked, that worked? Because uh, it'd be very easy to go through the history of Stripe and say, well, was this a deliberate choice or was this just kind of accidental and lucky? And I think most businesses, successful ones, come across that. But. Uh, I'm sorry, and when you say those things, um, uh, what, what do you mean? So I mean with um, like putting the API key in mm -hmm. um, and providing fantastic error messages that people will tweet out. Um, it seems like Stripe gets a lot of little things right. And the collection of all of those things makes it makes Stripe like a, an exceptionally fantastic story to follow and to look back on. And I'm curious how early it was that you guys started to recognize that these are the little things that add to the greater story, and how can we be deliberate about those moving forward? Yeah, I think it's hard to uh, go back and retroactively act. Um, uh, Add them in. I think it just has to be somewhat part of the uh, the product design process and, and kind of what you decide is the way that you uh, you design products. It actually gets a, a little different once you're you know Stripe now has order of I'd say 200 engineers and you know most of those people either directly or indirectly end up working on and, and, and shaping the product and then there's lots of people who are not in engineering who end up working on the product in various. Um, capacities and so it ends up being pretty different once you have you know people who, whose names you don't even know working on this stuff and you want to inculcate it from a cultural point of view but in the early stages uh, there's a lot of stuff that is not measurable I mean usually because the um, the, the, the data are too small. You just have to, you know, you, you can't measure, you know, we'll, we'll do these things in the product and see which leads to the, you know, the largest, num you know, social engagement or something because, again, you just, you don't have a st statistically significant data set and so you kind of have to go on instinct for that stuff. Right, so it's more or less just guessing at what you think is the best thing to do and then once you've accumulated enough data, yeah. it's really kind of looking back at that and saying, oh, yeah. what pictures can we draw from this? Yeah. Okay. yeah, and we've had a lot of time to go back and, um, uh, kind of see what we think worked well, and then you know pour gas on, on, on those particular activities and call the call the things that didn't. And that I think people tend to perceive Stripe as this like overnight success. You know, Patrick and I are coming with we, we this tradition of Stripe, where uh, we someone imported it from Microsoft, where people bring in uh, n pounds of, of chocolate on their um, uh, nth anniversary, and so you know on your fifth anniversary at Stripe, uh, you'll bring in five pounds of chocolate. And obviously, if you do the math, this leads to a really bad place because you know you have people getting more tenured and a group number of employees and so you, you you wonder does the chocolate per employee go up over time and it does in kind of a scary fashion but anyway uh, uh, Patrick and I are coming up on our eighth anniversary working on Stripe soon where uh, we'll have to I guess bring in 16 pounds of chocolate uh, which is rather a lot um, but anyway, we've been, given that we've been working on it for this long, just year after year, you continually go through this process of you know what's working well, what isn't, what should we kind of continue to invest mm -hmm. in. Okay. Um, so if you kind of look back at what the history of Stripe has been, if you were to look, point out maybe two things that you would do differently based mm -hmm. on what you know now versus what you did then, whether they were mistakes or just you know market position or something along those lines, what what two things kind of stick out in your mind as things that you would do just completely differently now? Um, we are, we're fortunate to be in the position where there's probably no big giant kind of, uh, you know, thing of cratering impact that happens during Stripe's history. So it's sort of like, well, we definitely wouldn't, you know, do that where, you know, I'll get arrested. Um, but, uh, but, but there's a bit of selection bias there, right? And that I probably wouldn't be here um, uh, talking to you if, uh, if there was one of those moments. So you, you have to find the company that, you know, uh, for, for an interesting answer to that question, you have to find the companies that uh, had somewhat more ignominious ends. Um, that said, I mean, the, the, the minor stuff is, uh, 
there are issues that we spent years beating our head against the wall where I think that the answer was pretty obvious in retrospect. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's always pretty pa painful when you, you, know, uh, you, you measure something and you know, uh, on a chart, you know, if down is good, like uh, uh, latency or whatever, you make some tiny change uh, and like the, the chart just falls off a cliff. That's really painful because like, we could have made that change two years um, earlier. And so, you, you know, just something off the top of my mind that I was thinking about recently, I think we are not particularly happy yet with the usefulness of one Stripe subscriptions logic where I think um, um, we, we, we could just do a much better job of it. And two, just the usefulness of the Stripe dashboard. Uh, and so those are things that, you know, if I was to go back and do it again, I would probably invest much more four years ago versus kind of now what we're doing. I actually, uh, I'll use this as a quick plug for, uh, I brought Adam who is, where is Adam gone? That corner. Oh yeah, he's waving at the back there. He's uh, back there with Patty Eleven. Uh, Adam runs the Stripe dashboard, and so we would be very eager to hear any uh, if uh, all your bug reports to uh, to Adam, please, or <laughs> any, any feedback you have. Um, but that's probably something I would have changed a little earlier. Okay. Um, I guess on that note, you because you recently overhauled your dashboard. How difficult was it, given the size of the Stripe customer base and how many people are using it? How difficult was it to kind of retrofit that dashboard or develop it in parallel with what you've got now, and then kind of toggle things over? Um, I mean, one of the things that strikes me is that within Stripe, when you uh, sign up for an account, you can go for an extremely long time without ever upgrading to like a new version. Um, and I've talked to people, and it's just like that's that's unheard of. That's amazing that you're still able to use something from 2011, and I know people who are using that version. Oh, we know them too. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, the, like that CIA deck of cards. There's like five of them, and you know their names. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> so um, how is it that you were able to, to do that? Like, What sort of challenges were, were there associated with that? Because there's impacts on your feature development and new, like new feature development and making sure that everything's still going to work when you go over, um, managing customer expectations along with making sure that there's a base level of functionality, et cetera. Yeah, yeah that, for, um, uh, th that for me is maybe a, a good example of kind of the, the pr product feedback and customer empathy point in that uh, you know, one of the things when we talk to people who are using PayPal uh, and using the PayPal API is just, you know, you, you'd have integrated it and then it would randomly break at some point and then you'd have a fire drill when you go fix it. And it seems like, you know, a property of relying on an API should be that it behaves the same over time. Like that's a, a pretty useful uh, fundamental construct. Um, and, and that's not what they were getting. And so uh, from a technical point of view, what we designed is, um, it's actually kind of cool, is basically when you make an API request to, um, uh, Stripe, uh, say, say using the old API, you know, we are running the newest API and then there's kind of a series of translation layers like an onion that go and kind of roll forward the old API request to the new API request and kind of reformat it such that everything is, uh, is backwards compatible so that internally we can roll out stuff at a fairly fast rate but people can use old versions of the API. Actually, maybe that's another good example uh, to your question of what I might change in retrospect. Um, we didn't set any kind of a cutoff period uh, and so we do have people from like, I don't know if we have anyone from, we probably do have people from 2010 who still, you know, their API integrations are working, and I think it's probably good at some points to roll people forward to the newest version of the API, because it's just like, it makes changes too scary, right? Mm -hmm. Where if you want to use one new feature, then you have to redo everything. Um, but yeah, that for us was a pretty obvious one. Okay. Looking back on your history a little bit, just as a last question, we'll kind of, then we'll take some things from the audience. When you look at the things that have happened, is there a low point that you can kind of point to that sticks out in your mind is, you know, you weren't really sure that you were going to be able to pull things off or even get through the other side? Because, you know, it could, whether it was funding or just technical issues or, you know, scaling the business or making different partnerships, anything that jumps out of you is um, potentially like very, very scary at the time. Yeah, this is, um, this is one actually thing that's actually very useful about, you know, Patrick and I know a bunch of other um, people running technology companies or whatever. Uh, and I think having a peer group of people who are in a similar position is, um, is really useful because the PR story never tells the whole thing, right? You want to have that, you know, er er everything is perfect and always has been. And we've always been uh, kind of uh, known everything about the business and you, know, you have this very uh, pristine image uh, and underneath you're, you're kind of furiously uh, trying to keep things together. The, the, to, to, and actually, I think one thing that's been useful for me and Patrick is the fact that there, there are two of us and always ha have been in that you, 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 maybe your mood is the, the average of the two moods. And so you know, the amplitude of the swings is, is lessened by that kind of dampening effect. Um, and uh, that actually, once you start having employees, I think is a 
really important role of the fender is, uh, again, dampening the swings that tend to come with both kind of the highs being too high and the lows being too low. For, for us, uh, one, you know, during the um, early days, we had a handful of pretty bad outages. And to begin with, uh, it was kind of scary in the opposite. Uh, you know, in the very early days, we, we would have an outage and then um, uh, and no one cared, no one called. And that was bad because like, oh, we have no customers. Um, <laughs> And then, uh, then as usage started picking up, you know, I remember at one point uh, when there were a lot of people using Stripe, we had uh, an hour's outage or best part of an hour uh, during the month of December on a weekday. And I really would not recommend that as a life experience. Um, also, there was one, um, you know, during the early stages of a company, an employee leaving or kind of multiple employees leaving is that at least for us, it's like, shit, are we, I mean, will Stripe ever amount to anything? Are we going to pull through this? You know, we had some early engineers leaving. That was, that was hard. Okay. Um, we're going to take a couple of uh, questions from the audience. Rob's going to go around. So uh, we've got about 10 minutes or so left. Uh, first question. I'm, wo I'm wondering uh, what's your big focus in focus in terms of acquisition now? Like, are you really focused on acquiring new users? And how are you doing that now? Uh, we, we know about word of mouth, but what's, what's kind of the new strategy? Or is it still just word of mouth? Um, word of mouth is uh, definitely a big part of it for us. And, and again, I think it's helpful that you know, we're in a well-defined space where people need to actually buy something in this space. You, know, you can't not accept money. Um, and it's, it's kind of interesting to people. But again, I do want to stress the word of mouth not being a, a, a fundamental constant of the universe. Um, we have always uh, worked on PR fairly actively. Uh, and that is something that uh, you, know, you can actually use to, to help drive word of mouth. Again, it's part of the cycle where you know, people are tweeting an article or, or, or stuff like this. And so you know, this week, there were three separate events that there were uh, articles written about. There was, uh, you know, we had the acquisition of Indie Hackers. We had uh, Increment Magazine uh, that launched uh, today. And then we uh, relaunched Atlas and, and added some functionality earlier this week. But in all of those, you know, part of what we wanted to do was just uh, ensure that the story was told in a fairly high fidelity way and uh, actually in some detail. And so there, there were stories about all of those. So, so, so that is a, a large one uh, for us. And if you can get that right, if you have uh, something interesting to actually talk about or if you can make it interesting, um, that is, uh, you know, when we launched Atlas, this blew us away. But when we launched Atlas, it was on the front page of the International New York Times. Uh, and uh, you know, if you'd asked us five years ago, uh, I mean, uh, we, 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 would, we wouldn't have believed you. Um, but uh, th that's the kind of mind share that I mean, really, you can't. Uh, I mean, I, like I said, you literally can't pay for it because you can buy ad space there. But uh, it's, it's certainly pretty expensive. So that's one. And um, two is we are always thinking about the the funnel, um, and uh, we are. Um, Actually, Adam and I were just chatting on the flight over about some funnel optimization stuff uh, that we uh, want to go work on to improve that. Uh, and uh, you know, thinking about getting further out the funnel and kind of bringing people in. We have uh, all of this done. Uh, I feel like once you once you say content marketing, it kind of gets it kind of it's it's like you you know if you're scuba diving, you shouldn't touch the coral because it dies instantly. And I feel like there's a bit of that with the term content <laughs> marketing, where it loses its interestingness a bit, where it's like ah, some fresh content and um, grist for the mill. Um, but uh, we, we have always done content marketing on uh, on a bit of an ad hoc basis. And so one of our earliest efforts was uh, capture the flag. I don't know if any of you guys played that contest. Um, where we did uh, three of them. But that was massive in terms of just having people hear about Stripe and you know, uh, establish some technical credibility. And so I think we want to do more stuff like that. It, it is very hard to, at scale, do creative and, and interesting things in that I think there are lots of companies that uh, manage to uh, you know, f figure out the uh, content organ grinder where you're just churning out the um, the at scale stuff. I don't think we have figured out an at scale way to, uh, to to produce interesting content stuff, and so it's still a little ad hoc right now. But uh, hopefully, scale that up. Excellent, Thanks. John, right here. Mm -hmm. uh, first, thank you to you and your brother for supporting MicroConf. So it's great to see you guys here uh, year after year. Uh, my question to you would be: Where do you see the mobile checkout experience going over the next few years? Yeah, this is um, super interesting. Uh, basically, uh, we think Apple Pay and Android Pay are going to win. Uh, in that uh, both are 
very good at being that kind of large company phenomenon of being patient. And so even if the first version of the product isn't quite right, they kind of keep on iterating until they get it right. And then we just have the data and um, we look at it and they're, they're growing like weeds and the conversion rates are way higher. And so I would be really surprised if that's not what everyone is using. I mean, aside, the, there's some kind of exceptions to that where if you are Amazon, you now have enough stored customer credentials that you don't need that. But um, if you look at, uh, a good one to look at on the, uh, on the consumer side is Wish. They are conversion optimization machines. Uh, they are just really, really down the details on this stuff. And their funnels are kind of scary fast because you guys have probably seen their ads on Facebook, but they just like hoover people in from Facebook at scale. Uh, and it's, it's really in their interest to have a, a a highly converting funnel, um, and I think those are those are going to be big. What I'm excited by is on the mobile side, um, uh, new products actually being possible because the, the the mobile checkouts will get easier enough. And so, you know, occasionally people will tweet a link from the Wall Street Journal or the Financial Times, and I'll click into it, and I'll be like, oh, paywall, never mind. And you know, just the bounce rate is 100% uh, in in my personal experience. Whereas if you could actually quickly uh, buy a day pass or something, I think it probably would. And so the, the, there are similar, you know, you, you can't today buy a, a, an issue of the Wall Street Journal online just because the amount of work required is, is, is not worth it for that experience. Uh, I think that will probably change as the checkouts get better. And it's interesting to think our, what, our, what the second order effects will be. Uh, higher conversion rates is one, but uh, there's probably a bunch of new products that are possible that, that weren't previously. Next question. Awesome. Here, one more over here. Hi. Um, so it, it seems from what you, the way you talk, you and your partner are on a very much a unified front. I was actually wondering what is the decision making process between you and Patrick behind the scenes, if you don't mind me answering. Yeah. Or asking. Um, so. I, I I think for a good decision making process like the one Patrick and I. Um, uh, has, for, uh, for, for that to work, um, you need a few things. One, you need to be, uh, in, in terms of the long-term vision of where things are going and kind of the values and, and how you look at the world, you actually have to be pretty aligned there, and that's surprisingly hard at times. Uh, and th th that solves a lot of things. So Patrick and I are pretty aligned on you know, what Stripe is, broadly what we should be doing over the next you know, two or three years, over, over the long term what we want it to become, uh, and, and that's pretty useful to begin with. Second, I think you need to be able to distinguish between the, uh, the things that matter and the things that don't, basically. And that sounds, again, really obvious and, and sort of tautological, but uh, it ends up being pretty important. So there'll be many things that Patrick and I, on a day-to-day -day basis, kind of disagree with the other's decision, but that's kind of, I'm, I'm happy to go with it. And then Patrick and I, probably more than most co-founders, have, have a fairly overlapping set of areas of interest. And so I think the, you know, one of the traditional things you see a lot, at least in you know, the Bay Area where I am, is uh, you know, if you have the technical co-founder and the business co-founder. And there, the delineation of responsibilities is, is very, very clear and crisp. With Patrick and I, it's, it's, it's more overlapping. But you still have kind of, this is my area and this is your area. And so basically, high trust when people are operating within their own areas and kind of overturning when it matters. For those who don't, or who aren't aware, uh, John and Patrick are brothers as well. Yeah, so. we've been resolving conflicts uh, can, for for quite a while. I can imagine that's difficult. Yeah. <laughs> uh, next question over here. Yep. Hi. Thanks. Um, any thoughts or plans for Stripe, uh, regardless or on cryptocurrencies or bitcoins or stuff like that? Um, is, uh, have any of you guys asked uh, Patrick McKenzie about that? <laughs> um, uh, I, I always enjoyed that. But um, for, for, for me, I think, uh, so strategically, the way we look at Stripe is uh, it should be, you know, the, the way a business accepts money from its customers. And, uh, and that's obviously fairly broad uh, and deliberately so. And so if you're a SaaS business, we should have uh, very good support for all the SaaS primitives and the things that a SaaS company cares about. When it comes to payment methods, we're kind of like, whatever, we need to support um, uh, uh, whatever these businesses will uh, will need, and so we launched support for you know ACH a while back. We're uh, beta testing a bunch of the uh, local European <coughs> payment methods that uh, matter to people there, and we'll kind of continue adding all this stuff. And so with cryptocurrencies, from a from a pure pragmatic point of view, if 
if and when any of the cryptocurrencies get to significant consumer mind share and uh, consumer scale, uh, then we will support them because the businesses will want them. But our, we, we, we're kind of not dogmatic about it in that I don't think we want cryptocurrencies to happen for the, the, the sake of cryptocurrencies happening. And even if we wanted that, I don't think it would help really advance the cause of cryptocurrencies anymore. And so we, um, we added Bitcoin support because we wanted it to be, you know, s some of our the businesses on Stripe cared about it, and we wanted Stripe to be the place where they could, regardless of the payment method, accept money from their customers. Um, you know, obviously, Bitcoin is still not in wide usage today, or, or even you know, kind of, um, it, it's you know, f f fairly small and niche today. Uh, there are a bunch of you know, we could spend time talking about the interesting um, computer science properties and some of the interesting stuff that's happening with. Uh, uh, some of the newer cryptocurrencies, but I would say it's not, you know, top of our 2018 strategic planning list. If I could take tack onto that a little bit, yeah. do you think of it in terms of like the innovator's dilemma as well? Because I mean, that's kind of an up and coming thing, but you, you know, it's, it doesn't has, have any material impact on your business right now, but is it something that you're not, uh, not afraid of, but concerned about, or at least keeping it on your radar specifically because of that? Yeah, I mean, we do worry about kind of innovators dilemma, dilemma phenomena in, in general where you're, you're always trying to look out for what is the good enough solution that you know you will write off but uh, actually satisfies customers uh, quite a bit I don't think for, for a business selling online I don't think Bitcoin is good enough yet um, and so uh, it, that's not how we think about it yet um, but uh, who knows okay. well thank you oh. yeah thanks again John thank, thank you so you very much. much thanks for having me